I'd like for you to turn your Bibles to two places. Uh, John 3.16, I think you've heard it before, and uh, Romans 8.32, Romans 8.32, and these two verses go together. The title of my message this morning is God's gift to us, God's gifts to us. He's given us two things, he's given us many things, but there's two things that I think are very, very important. Uh, the first thing, he's given us his son, and then he's given us his supply. Those two things will help you the rest of your life. He's given us his son. He's given us his supply. And I'll teach as we go through this, okay? Uh, I think a lot of times what we do when we pray, uh, God's already given us so much. He's already promised us so much. We're in position for so much. And as a result of that, a lot of times we pray and God's already given us so much. And I think the song that uh, how much he loved us, and we ought to just be thanking him. And I think a lot of times we pray for things that he's already given us. And he's promised to make sure that he'll take care of us. And so I, I hope that you see that this morning as I go through this. John 3.16 says this here. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The greatest gift ever given has already been given. It's the Son of God. But a gift, in order to be possessed, it has to be accepted first, right? And so as a lost individual person, John 1.12 says this here. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. We have to personally receive the gospel by faith and grace. Now, I know that's John said that, but Paul said, this, said it this way in Acts 16, 30 and 31. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And then verse 31 says this, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house, if they also will put their faith in Christ and his work. Now, why should one believe or receive God's gift? Well, John 3, 16 again. Now, think about this. Think about the love behind this gift. Uh, they say, God so loved. God so loved the world, okay? I can't understand that. I know this, that all mankind are sinners. I know we're disobedient. We're deserving of judgment. But because God so loved us, he moved in mercy and in grace, and he gave us his very best. He gave us his only begotten son. And that was all because he so loved us. Amen? Not only that, think of the gift's value. The gift that God gave us. It's priceless. He gave us his only begotten son, and not only that, he gave us everlasting life when we put our faith in him. His son was given up to disgrace and death in order to deal with our sins. And then he gave us this free gift. Romans 6.23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So think about the love behind the gift. Think about the value of this gift. And then think about your need of this gift. John 3, 16 again. It states there, the last part of that verse, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's very, very simple. You trust Christ, you receive everlasting life. If you reject Christ, you receive perish. You receive eternity in hell one day. It's that simple, it's that clear, there's no other way. Now, a verse that goes along with this is Romans 8.32. He says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Now, the first part of that verse here is talking about his son. And the fact that God's given us his greatest gift, his son, do you think he's going to have a problem in favoring us in our life? If he was willing to give his son, don't you think he'll meet our needs? Uh, when you put that in perspective, it should encourage you. In Romans 8, 32, it states his own son. That shows the closeness and the nearness within the Godhead. 
God the Father and God the Son, they had been in closest relationship communion from eternity past. And later, as the God-man, Jesus said this, John 17, 24, he says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Before God ever came to this earth in the person of Christ, the Son and the Father, they had a love relationship with each other. And then the Father said about his Son in Matthew 3, 17, he said, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then he says in Matthew 17, 5, he says, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Yet in love and compassion, because of us being sinners, the Father gave us his Son. Now that's hard for us to comprehend that. This close-knit relationship for eternity, was willing to be somewhat separated from one another, one willing to give up the other one because of us and our sins, his own son. Now, Romans eight thirty two again, it states he spared not. Now, that sort of sounds kind of rough and stern. It, it went along with April's song when she was singing, actually. But despite the Father's majesty and holiness, despite... The father hearing his son cry out in prayer, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Despite the son's exceeding sorrow and strong cryings, cryings and infinite disgrace, in spite of all of that, the father delivered his son to be the sin bearer, to bear the load of sin that would have sent an entire world to hell. Now we understand that why God didn't spare the wicked angels in 2 Timothy there, or 2 Peter, I'm sorry. It says this, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down into hell and delivered them in the chains of darkness to be reserved in the judgment. I believe those are the fallen angels in Genesis 6 there that went into the daughters of men and created weird individual people. And so God, he spared them not. I understand he didn't spare the wicked old world in 2 Peter 2, 5 and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. He destroyed an entire world because of the wickedness, the imaginations of their sin and their evilness. I understand why he, he flooded this world. I understand also he spared not Israel, who rejected Christ as their Messiah and crucified him, and still rejected him as a risen Messiah. I understand that. In Romans eleven twenty one, 21, it states this, For if God spared not the natural branches, Israel, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. And so I understand that he didn't spare those individual people, but it's incomprehensible that God's grace would cause him not to spare his own son, his own son who was sinless and spotless and not spare him that we might be spared. Huh? Think that through. Ephesians 3, 17 and following, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love, his love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth of this love and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth, not passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. God says, I want you to try to comprehend this. You probably won't be able to, but if you study hard and you mature, you might be able to comprehend some reasons why God spared not his son, but delivered him up. In Romans eight thirty two again, it says this in that verse, but delivered him not. This means giving him over to another's power, also out of necessity. If there was only another way, but there was no other way. There was nothing. There was no one else that could pay 
for all of our sins and then in turn give us spiritual life. We sort of see this in a shadow through a father and a son, humanly speaking, in Abraham. In Genesis chapter 22, it says this here. And he said, God says to Abraham, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of, Mount Moriah. And then he says in verse 16, I believe it is, And said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. So we get a little foreshadow of the reality of one God, of one day God giving up his only son. And it was at the time of Abraham that Abraham, God told Abraham, and God will provide himself a lamb. He presented himself as a lamb to be offered up one day. So we get kind of a picture of that. Romans 8, 32 then. It says this, him up for us all. In other words, regardless of who we are, regardless of what color we are, what nationality are we are, regardless of how good we are or how bad we are, God delivered him up for us. But God committeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That was the whole purpose of it. I've mentioned before, I heard a missionary, he said he was in Africa. And he said, he was out there and he preached on John 3, 16 that day. And he said, God will save whosoever will if you just come and put your faith in Christ. And, you know, he said he'll save any of you. And as a couple of people came forward, he began to sense this odor. It was vile. It was, it was awful odor and he looked over and there was a leopard man who had to crawl to where the missionary stood and he said this will God even save somebody like me <laughs> and he reached down and he took that leopard's hand and he said whosoever will may come and that's what God has done for us he's given us his son but also he's given us his supply. And this is so important because I believe we're always praying for things that God has already given us or will give us because he promises us to take care of us. Now, I want you to listen to this. Notice verse 32 again. The last part of the verse. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? After the Father has made the supreme sacrifice... Do you think he would withhold his favor upon our life? If after buying a great big two-carat diamond for your, for your loved one. No, not true. But anyway, <laughs> let's pretend. <laughs> but you buy this big diamond. <laughs> Are you going to have any problem getting a box to put it in? Huh? I don't think there'll be any problem. This is the same sense, except it means more, it has a greater truth to it than him being the greatest gift and then what he provides for us being the lesser gifts. It has a greater truth to us. Now notice in that verse right there, notice it says, he, uh, uh, shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Notice the with him. This doesn't mean in addition to him but together with him, as one with him. That little word with, it's a preposition. And sometimes it's used as a prefix, like co or joint. Here's an example, uh, Ephesians 3, 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. We're fellow heirs with him. We're joint heirs with him. We're co-laborers with him. It doesn't mean that we own some part of his inheritance and others own another part of his inheritance. 
but it means together with him being one in Christ, we as believers own it, have inherited it, it all. Hmm? Dr. Cornelius Stam told an old story. He said this. He said there was an Arab man. He was unbelievably wealthy. Had all kinds of treasure. And he didn't have any close family living though. Except for a small son. But this Arab man, he was dying. So knowing he didn't have a loan... This Arab man, he made it known that in his treasure house, he had one precious gift to give to the first person who would ask for that gift. He had a lot of people who came and tried to select the one gift he had in mind. One after another, they guessed and they failed. Would it be a priceless gem? Would it be a necklace of real pearls? One after another, he turned away empty until one stumbly said this. He said to the Arab man, he said, this may be a strange request, but I would or should like to have this little lad. The feeble dying Arab, he beamed and he said this, you may have him and all these treasures too. Because he, this lad, is my heir. You get him, you get all the treasure. You get Christ, you get all his inheritance. Amen? That's his supply to us. We likewise with him get all the treasures of God because we by faith have chosen his son to be our saviors. So all things are freely given to us with Christ, with him. Ephesians 3, 5, and 6 uh, says this here, 2, 5, and 6, I'm sorry. Even when we were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where he is, I am. What he has, it's mine too. Huh? I can't comprehend that. I just thank him for that. Colossians 2.10 tells us that ye are complete in him, which is the head of all print. I'm complete because I'm with him. Being with him, we get all things. Here's an example of that. Colossians 2.11 and 12. In whom also ye are circumcised, now get this, with the circumcision made without hands. It's a spiritual circumcision in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the spiritual circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, that's spirit baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, that's why it's spirit, who hath raised him from the dead. Now get a hold of this. Both scriptural spiritual circumcision and spiritual baptism were performed by the operation of God the moment we put faith in Christ and the gospel. We were in Adam as sinners and the spirit of God took us out of Adam. He cut, he divided, he severed, he circumcised our relationship with Adam and then baptized us spiritually, spirit baptism, and placed us, identified us in the person of Christ, the body of Christ, the spiritual body of Christ. That took place the moment we were saved. He was buried. And because of faith, we are with him. We too were buried. He has risen. We with him have been spiritually raised too. His death his burial, his resurrection becomes ours because we're with him. He died, I died. He raised, I raised. Amen. That's all part of all things he has given us. Romans 6, 3 and following says, Know ye not that so many of us 
as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, into his spiritual body. There's not one drop of water in that verse, by the way. It's all spirit. We were spiritually baptized into the body of Christ. We're baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism in the death that like as Christ was raised up from the glory by, uh, by, uh, from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. That took place the moment you put your faith in Christ. Romans 8, 17 says it like this. And if children, then heirs. And heirs of God and joint with him. Joint heirs. That's that with. Joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. He's given us all things. Now all things, by the way, we can make our requests, but God has already promised that he will supply all our needs. God has already guaranteed us that he's going to meet every one of our needs as we live in faith and faithfulness to the truth of the word of God. He promises us in Romans eight twenty eight, And we know that here's the all things. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. All things, good, bad, prosperity, adversity, all of those things are included. God works the all things for good, changing our adversity into prosperity, our curses into blessings. Why? Because we are with Christ. And since we're with Christ, we receive all good things. That's his promise. That's his guarantee to us. We walk around here and we pray. We wring our hands. We worry. We fret. What's going to happen when God's already promised to give us all things that pertain to our life and godliness? Amen. Instead of wringing our hands, we ought to be on our hands praising him that we're one of his children. <laughs> and he's given us all these things. If he spared not his own son, don't you think he's going to freely give us all these things that's necessary for our life's journey that would honor and glorify him? I believe that he will with all my heart. Amen. Even the physical, material difficulties are by God's grace turned into spiritual blessings and victories. It's like the old time preacher. Uh, he had this bookmark on one side, the silk written phrase. And on the other side, all the threads were going everywhere. And he would visit the hospital and he'd show them the backside of that, all the threads going everywhere. And it was kind of, didn't make sense. It was unintelligible. He said, that's the way sometimes these things seem. Then he'd turn it over and in beautiful silk written, God is love. And it began to make sense then. You know, he turns our adversities, our difficulties into blessings, spiritual blessings and victories in our life. I, I remember uh, Carol and I, we lived on Comer Street down by Garfield Park in Indianapolis on Comer. And uh, I remember, probably because I smoked then, uh, I left to go pick the kids up. She was worked. She worked at the old Indian National Bank, and our house caught on fire. Probably I left a cigarette or something. And I came home with the kids, and all the firemen were there, and everything was out in the yard. My bowling ball was about this tall. I've, I've never. It just melted. Everything just melted. And because of that fire, we looked for another place to live. And we found a place called New Whiteland. I was 21. Matter of fact, oh, 24, I'm sorry. Matter of fact, I just had gotten saved. And God brought us down this area and began to give me a love. So he turned a tragedy, a difficulty, into something in our life, something that has been very, very wonderful and good. 
Uh, my mom, uh, I received a call. They, she had a heart attack. And they rushed her to the hospital. That was a very difficult circumstance because my mom was lost. She was 67 at that time, I think. And I remember I went to the hospital. And I had the, had the privilege of hearing my mom cry out to Jesus to save her that night. She, she, it, it turned that difficulty into something that was wonderful. A year later, she contracted cancer. and She lived for a year and she passed away then. But I know mom's in heaven. But I say that God's already promised that to us. If we just live faithfully for him. If we just, amen? amen. Try to do his will for our life or whatever it might be. It states he's given us all the riches of Christ because we're with him. That's his supply. It was grace that found us. His grace that forgives us. His grace that fixes us. For here, for heaven, for happiness. It's his grace that fortifies us. In our life, he puts saints around us. He seals, we have the seal of God upon us and the spirit of God within us. And grace will finish us. His grace is sufficient for the course. Sufficient for the conflict. And sufficient for the crown one day. That's God's grace. And God's promise to us is we have all things for our life. They have been given to us because we are with him. That's why we have all of these things. And there are many things we don't need to ask God for. Because God has already promised us. He's already given those to us. All things that are good. And we need to just have faith in what he's already given us. And for us to learn what he has already given us, that means I need to study the Pauline epistles so that I can know what he's given for me in this dispensation of grace, the gospel of grace. Not somewhere else in somebody else's purpose of those all things for their lives, but only what applies to me because I'm in the body of Christ and I'm with him. And it's as I learn that truth and I learn these spiritual things that take place in my life that he's given me, I would be more on my knees thanking him and praising him and glorifying him for everything that he's done for me and I know he's going to take care of me. Amen. And that's for you too. He, Ephesians 1, 3, he says this here. Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. With Christ, in Christ. And these spiritual blessings are critical for us today. Now, I just mentioned these and I close. They're all found in Ephesians. Chapter 1, verse 4 says this. As you look at that verse, God chose us in eternity past to be part of the body of Christ. That's a blessing. Before the world ever began, he thought of us. Before the world ever began, he already has chosen us to be identified with the body of Christ. In verse 5, he's adopted us we're now the sons of God. And being sons of God, we have the privileges and the rights of citizens of heaven. In verse 6, he's made us accepted in Christ. And because we're accepted in him, that gives us full access to the throne of grace to our heavenly father. In verse 7 and 8, he's redeemed us. He's paid our sin debt in full. He set us free. Huh? And we have access to him. In verse 9 through 12, we've been given the truth of the mystery program. God's secret will. Kept secret since the world began. But now 
with Paul, been revealed to him, to others, and now to us. And we're part of this great secret where we understand the full accomplishment of the cross that God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. That was not known previous to the apostle Paul. Amen. Verse 13, the Holy Spirit placed us into, baptized us into the body of Christ sealing us there for all eternity. And the seal upon us is the Spirit himself, and that gives us security. In verse 14, God's given us the Spirit as the earnest, but that means that makes God obligated to finish the process. I have been saved, I am being saved, I will be saved. I have been justified. I am being sanctified. And praise God, one day I'll be glorified. And that's dependent upon Almighty God. We have that in Christ. And the last thing is in verse uh, Romans 1, 7. In Romans 1, 7, he made all believers saints. <laughs> We're not dead saints. We're living saints. We're God's holy ones upon this earth. And God has blessed us with spiritual blessings. Yes, physical, but because of these spiritual blessings, now I'm in position to experience the physical blessings that that brings with it. But until I know those things and learn those things, I'll never pray what is right during my own life physically. When I realize I have all these things, what in the world could I ask for? Huh? I know he's going to come through for me. I know he's going to be good to me. I know he's going to meet my every need because he's promised me. Not only will he, but he already has. That's why we praise him. That's why we worship him. That's why we just try to honor and we glorify him. He spared not his only son, his only begotten son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he with him freely not give us all these things? And that's God's promise to you and to me. He's given us his son and he's given us his supply. What a savior. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Father, we love you today. I don't know why you love people like us, <laughs> but we're so grateful we're grateful for the day you visited our heart. You showed us our sin. You convicted us. You condemned us. But then you showed us the Savior, high and lifted up, that you didn't spare. And that convinced us. We put our faith in him and his resurrection, and that converted us. And God, you continue to cleanse us through your word. May we be good brands. May we study hard that we might learn all the blessings and the supply that you've given us who have been saved. It's there. We just need to know it's there and begin to thank you for it. Thank you for taking care of us. As I look back on my life, God, you've never failed me once. I've failed you often, but you've always come through for me. And you do every child of God because you're a good God. And all these things are good and we praise you for it. You even turn tragedy, you even turn heartache into spiritual growth, spiritual victory, spiritual power in one's life so that we can say everything that you allow to come in our life and you use in our life is for good. And God, we praise you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, This ministry is made possible by the faithful giving of our members and viewers. We would appreciate your financial help so that we can continue to present this program. Please send your tax-deductible gift to Grace Point Church, 330 West Whiteland Road, New Whiteland, Indiana, 46184. If you would like a recording of today's message or to learn more about our fellowship, please visit our website at gracepointministries.net or call 317-535-3512. Until next week, God bless you.